All right, so I'm going to, um, we're going to be speaking now about osteochondral lesions of the talus. So I'll do the first part, uh, focusing on more smaller lesions. And uh, I found this topic in general very vexing because I find the more that I read about this and sometimes the more confused I get. But I think we have a little bit better clarity now. So as we know, the etiology of uh, these lesions, it's uh, the most common articular cartilage injury in the ankle, more common in active young males, usually result of trauma. Um, but also um, noted prevalence in patients that are, um, have hypovitamosis D as well. A lot of times these patients present with pain, mechanical symptoms. They tend to describe it as more of a deep pain. It's worse with ambulation, or they could have some type of ankle sprain, injury, something like that, and just the pain just doesn't get better. Um, and basically, the articular cartilage, as we know, it lacks the intrinsic capability to fix itself, and so it can degrade over time. So. It's good to have uh, appropriate imaging that can help you plan how to treat these patients. So certainly start with x-rays. You can have stress radiographs to rule out any concomitant stability. MRI and CAT scan can help uh, with the location, the size of the lesion, give you ideas about the overlying cartilage, any cystic changes, the quality of the bone, marrow edema. Um, and also, if the patient has had any prior procedures, you want to know exactly what they had done uh, as well. Um, and when we treat it, uh, as with everything, you really have to individualize the treatment plan based on the patient's symptoms, their age, um, how they injured it, again, the size and the depth of lesion, the location is a contained lesion, is on the shoulder, um, what does the bone look like, and then anything else, do they have instability, do they have malalignment, and again, what are the treatments have they had? So the literature tends to support uh, proceeding with the course of non-operative treatment if there's not obvious mechanical symptoms, typically if you're acute, stable lesions, non-displaced, skeletal immature patients that are more than eight months from physio closure. And so usually a course of non-weight bearing, anti-inflammatories. Um, and the largest trial was this Zengering trial, which showed about 45% success rate uh, if they proceed with a non-operative treatment. Um, and especially if they're non-weight bearing in a cast, um, they do even a little better. Um, there's really no consensus in the literature exactly how long you should do it for, exactly how you should immobilize uh, the use of uh, NSAIDs or therapy in this course. Um, Smith looked at the uh, use of uh, additional augments in non-operative treatments, so use of platelets or hyaluronic acid. Uh, and so the platelets obviously have all these cells to try and uh, stimulate a healing response, inhibit the local catabolic cytokines, and show that it can reduce pain and improve function. And May Dan also looked and compared PRP versus HA and conservative treatment found that PRP was significantly better. That being said, um, a lot of times these lesions go on to require operative treatment. And so um, when I look at this, I, I see how the cartilage is affected, how the bone is affected. And sometimes they're not both affected. So if it affects the bone but the cartilage is intact, um, you can consider doing a retrograde drilling procedure. Um, as you can see in the top right there, and there's some other guides you can use to kind of help localize. But so when the cartilage is intact and they have a bony lesion, you consider bone grafting. Uh, to try and repair the subchondra bone. So you can use local bone graft. Some kind of, you can use some of these bone filler, these substitutes. And the literature shows the improved function, um, lack of lesion degeneration. Uh, the problem is that 20% of the time, e even with fluoroscopic guidance, you can miss target. Um, what to do if you just have subchondromer edema? So you have a significant edema like you can see here, the cartilage is intact. And most of the time, uh, the more severe the mer edema is on MRI, the worse the clinical outcome. Um, MRI can kind of overestimate marrow edema as well, but um, you can see here on the right side there, that's a really uh, significant edema. It can be very painful. So if they really have, don't have mechanical symptoms, I think a, a trial course of non-weight bearing is indicated. Um, there's some um, evidence to support potentially using some type of bone stimulation or electromagnetic fields. We'll talk about that later, uh, which can try and improve angiogenesis and stimulate more of a vascular response to that kind of injury. Um, but if they have a larger lesion that's a cystic lesion, uh, but again, if cartilage is intact, it really depends on the size. Um, so you can, again, try and bone graft these lesions. You can use some type of void substitute. And you want to try and um, debris the defect if you can, but also provide support. Um, you can certainly retrograde your bone graft um, and then some other procedures that Mark will talk about in a little bit. Um, if the cartilage is affected, you can see in the bottom right there, you could do uh, some type of bone regenerative procedure and bone graft beneath it, so, so sort of a sandwich type procedure. Um, there's also subchondroplasty, where essentially you can also do this minimally invasive technique, and essentially uh, you cannulate certain areas, you target it, and then you can fill it with a calcium phosphate substitute. So when the lesions affect the bone and the cartilage, uh, 
Um, it's really this table looks at the basically three general types of repair, regeneration, replacement. We're going to focus more on the left side with the, with the smaller lesions. So in general, um, our threshold is narrowed a little bit. So for symptomatic lesions less than 10 millimeters, um, you could try a course of conservative treatment. Otherwise, debridement and microfracture are, are still the standards of care right now. And with the larger lesions, which we'll hear about later, there's some other options um, as well. So certainly, again, I think it's really important you have to address the malalignment. So if a patient comes in with a symptomatic osteochondral lesion, but they have an alignment like this, obviously you have to correct the cause because this is most likely what caused the lesion in the first place. And we'll talk about the use of biologics and treatment as well. So microfracture or bone marrow stimulation has is, is really been the standard of care for these smaller lesions. It's the idea is that basically you drill into the subchondral bone, it releases a bunch of stem cells and growth factors, it can stimulate vascular ingrowth into the lesion. Um, however, we know that it fills with fiber cartilage, um, which over time can degrade. Uh, in the shorter term, um, there's um, a very high uh, success of the results, but over time we're concerned that they degrade over time. So this is the way that um, you do it. You set up your um, scope. Um, I like to put the heel at the edge of the bed, and I use it as a non-invasive distractor for this. Um, you can usually assess most lesions with the scope. So typically, your anterior medial anterior lateral portal, you can get about 50%. You can use the posterior lateral portals as well. Um, you can use the bolster of the distraction um, and multiple portals to see what you have to see. I think that specialized instruments can help with the debridement of the lesions. So some of these ring curettes or angle curettes, uh, and, and then in terms of the microfracture alls, you want to make sure you can get over to perpendicular to the lesion. So that can be very helpful. At the same time, you want to address any other concomitant symptoms, mechanical issues with loose bodies, unstable cartilage, and you want to debride the necrotic bone. So the idea is that you debride the loose cartilage to a stable rim, you debride the necrotic bone, uh, and then you can um, make sure it's a stable rim so that when the clot forms, that it can attach to that stable rim of cartilage and it won't basically float away. Um, you debride the calcified cartilage layer, and then you'll puncture it with your microfracture awl, um, really along the periphery, at least three to four millimeters apart, uh, and most awls are about three to four millimeters deep. Uh, and then you can um, let the tourniquet down, or you can turn off the inflow, and you want to look for subchondral bone bleeding or fatty droplets. Um, Post-op, uh, there's really not a lot of consensus, and I think we'll talk about this in the discussion, in terms of when to start weight-bearing to protect this lesion, when to actually remove the boot, uh, activity restrictions. Um, but it's still, again, like I said, the gold standard for lesions less than one, mil one centimeter, 85% uh, good to excellent outcomes in the short to intermediate term, really up to four years. Um, they start uh, going down after that, and it's been shown in the literature um, that sometimes these, pa these patients just don't do well in the long run, so over four years. Um, so microfracture, again, smaller lesions, more acute focal lesions, and it should be contained. So non-shoulder lesions, those are the best. Um, in terms of return to sport, really very limited studies. I think you have to individualize your treatment, what kind of sport they're going back to, impact, non-impact. Um, Hurley looked at uh, these patients' return to sport is usually around four and a half months, um, but sometimes it can be as long as 12 months. Um, but certainly we can accelerate with rehab uh, with early weight-bearing and range of motion. So a lot of the newer studies are starting to uh, let these patients weight bear as early as two to four weeks, depending on the size of the lesion and where the lesion is located, whether it's contained or not. However, despite the successful short-term outcomes, we know that over time, um, this heals with fiber cartilage as opposed to the normal hyaline cartilage, and these outcomes can decrease over time. So Furco showed the 35% decrease in outcomes at five years. Um, Lee showed only 30% uh, integration with native cartilage when they looked at a year later. Uh, and there's a de-differentiation, again, from the fiber cartilage um, to this, sorry, from the hyaline cartilage to the fiber cartilage. And this is really what we're looking at when we do the, the uh, microfracture. So this is your articular cartilage layer, which is injured, and then you have your calcified cartilage, which you're breeding, and then you're penetrating into the subchondral bone plate and the subarticular spongiosa. And the problem is, and we've l learned this a lot these last few years, is that it provides, it, it, it damages the subchondral bone. So it creates a trauma to the subchondral bone, and a lot of times um, this can't uh, repair itself. So subchondral bone is very important. It provides the mechanical support for the cartilage, there's also this crosstalk uh, between the cartilage uh, and the bone um, that helps to maintain uh, the bone and cartilage homeostasis, and this is, is not always restored um, after microfracture. So that's why some of these patients have tended to do well early on, uh, but over time it can degrade, especially if uh, the damage remains in the bone. So when you Becker looked at this with MRIs, he found that when you looked at intermediate follow-up, there was very inhomogeneous structure of the cartilage repair in all the patients. There's insufficient or excessive filling in two-thirds, and there's a high rate of subchondral changes.
Riley looked at this as well and saw that only 14 out of 58 patients were well healed, um, but there was no difference necessarily in the outcome scores at that point. Um, so we still are trying to figure out what is the best way to assess these patients. But 78% of these patients, the subchondral bone had not filled in when the, at the year mark. Shimizona looked at this um, with Dr. Kennedy and found that maybe the short-term bone marrow edema and pain is physiologic. So they found that two years, it was pretty common to have some kind of marrow edema, but it was more pathologic if this persisted. So if you had this marrow edema at four years, then that was really pathologic and results in worse outcomes. And you can see here that, you can see in the bottom that when you do the microfracture, um, you create a trauma into the bone, and then you have this perihole bone resorption uh, that can decrease uh, the density of the subchondral bone plate. And so maybe the, the answer is to try and do debridement uh, down through calcified cartilage, but not go into the subchondral bone, uh, which can um, uh, lead to um, less resorption. So you can see here that um, on the right side, uh, where the microfracture um, damages, and um, this it can heal here. This is an equine model, um, but the losses maybe could be minimized with bone marrow aspirate. So bone marrow aspirate has been shown in a bunch of studies to have a protective effect on the bone marrow. Um, it can um, increase the osteoblastic activity, can minimize osteoclast activity. It can also physically um, sometimes block the aggressive synovial fluid from going into the sites of the microfracture, or if you're doing OATS procedure, going into uh, the tunnels to try and minimize uh, cystic changes. Um, some other things we could consider also a smaller diameter of microfracture all. So most of them are typically somewhere between two and four millimeters. There are ones that are one millimeter. They're not curved. But if you can get perpendicular access, that could be um, something that might improve the quality of the cause repair and the outcomes. Um, SAO also looked at this, and again, the bone is just not restored at short and midterm follow-up. The density is significantly reduced, but biologics and adjuvants um, can help with the post op morphology and the healing of the bone and the cartilage. Um, so you look at this slide here, and you can see the, um, that if you add it, if you do the, just the debridement, so you don't go into the bone, then the uh, subchondral bone is relatively well maintained. If you do the microfracture into the subchondral bone, you can see it doesn't heal. If you add aspirate to the microfracture patient, you can see that um, it's much less damage to the subchondral bone. And this was also confirmed by Hannon, which showed that when you added BMAC to the bone marrow stimulation, it can improve the cartilage repair, and can improve the scores with outcomes, also the MOCART scores. So in general, when you think about augmentation, um, uh, PRP can also have a role. Um, so Guni showed this, uh, that if you added PRP to your bone marrow stimulation procedure, you had improved functional outcomes. Dural showed the same thing, and Gormelli compared PRP or hyaluronic acid and found that PRP was more effective if you gave it uh, in addition to doing the bone marrow stimulation procedure. So what are some other um, ways we can try and improve this is uh, the particular juvenile cartilage allografts. Um, so the question is, is that uh, in patients that had failed bone marrow stimulation, we had lesions that were a little bit larger. Um, you could create a scaffold with these live juvenile chondrocytes harvested from uh, uh, donors that were younger than 13 years old and then glued into defect. And some of the early studies showed maybe some improved pain function over the short term. Uh, but Dr. Dracos looked at this and actually found that in the end, the subchondral bone, again, was not intact 86% of the time and found that by adding uh, the, the uh, juvenile cartilage allograft to, and BMAC showed no improvement compared to if you just did the microfracture alone. What if you add an extracellular matrix cartilage allograft? So again, another biologic adjuvant can do. This is allogeneic cartilage extracellular matrix. Has a, a type two collagen, a lot of growth factors. So you create your defect with the bone marrow. It can allow for stem cell migration to defect, and you can paste this on there. It can improve the scaffold, combine it with PRP or BMAC, and allow the stem cells to mix with the matrix and potentially form a hyaline-like cartilage. Um, so they're really limited long-term studies right now, but um, France looked at this with Dr. Dracos and found that the deposition of the allograft acted as, a, again, a bioscaffold, so it could promote cartilage healing, high patient satisfaction. Uh, in lesions, again, less than 10 to 15 millimeters, you could see improved functional outcomes if you did the marrow stimulation in addition to this allograft in addition to um, bone marrow aspirate. Also had higher MOCART scores as well. So I think one of the other uh, confounding factors is that we don't really know how best to assess the results. So we have a cartilage grading system. We have MOCART, which looks at the MRI results. But what really is the best way to, to see how these patients are doing? So sometimes um, uh, some studies have looked at doing a second look arthroscopy. And again, maybe we're not doing as well as we think we are. So if you look here on the right, you know, you, you think that 
uh, the cartilage lesion here, again, microfracture. You can see the MRI on the bottom left there. And you can see there's, there's a relatively good um, association with the way it looks at the time of the arthroscopy. Uh, but again, this study found 40% of the pair tissue is abnormal. This study just uh, last year um, showed that 36% of the lesions were incompletely healed with an inferior non hyaline like tissue that was noted at the scope. And there was a 24% mismatch between the MRI. So you can see here, the MRI looks like the lesion is relatively well healed. But when you look at the arthroscopy, you see that's lifted up and it's unstable. I think second look arthroscopy might be uh, the way of the future, especially if we have more non invasive ways to do this. So I've started um, using this interview, which is a small bore needle arthroscopy. You can actually do this in your office or in, in the surgery center. Uh, you can anesthetize them, you can go in, it's with a needle basically, and you can look and see. Um, you can't do anything. Uh, 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 you can't do anything besides diagnostics. You can't excise any loose bodies or loose cartilage, but patients sometimes like to see this, and this may have more use uh, versus an MRI if you can actually see it. Also, the nanoscope, um, uh, you, by only having 1.9 millimeter chip on the tip, so this is also a very minimally invasive way that we can go in and potentially address some of these issues. In terms of larger lesions, but still on the relatively smaller side, uh, we move more into the cartilage regeneration replacement uh, side. So ACI has been around really since the early 90s. It's more for contained larger lesions that have ideally a focal stable rim. Typically patients that have failed uh, a bone marrow stimulation procedure. And the idea here is the benefit to try and regenerate the damaged cartilage, but instead of fiber cartilage, more of a hyaline-like tissue. The downside is it's really two surgeries. Um, you have to harvest the chondrocytes in, in the original and the first generation to take an open fashion. Then you expand them, culture, and then eventually you come back and you reimplant them under a peristal flap that you have to sew in uh, to the cartilage. Um, so these are really the indications, but primarily in the revision type setting, it's for a little bit larger contained lesions. Um, these are some of the contraindications. And really there's just a lack of controlled trials. Um, this was one of the bigger ones in 2014 and found that there were definitely improved outcomes. 86% uh, improved at the second look arthroscopy, but it's a very costly procedure, multiple procedures, and there's a risk of overgrowth of the tissue as well. So you get this hypertrophy, periosteal hypertrophy. So more recently though, um, this was just approved in this country for matrix induced. So instead of having to come back and do a, a periosteal patch, you can just place on a matrix. Um, so you're culturing it. Um, you can actually culture it from the, the lesion itself, so from the osteochondral lesion itself, the cartilage, as opposed to going to someplace else. But it's still uh, two procedures, um, and so you have to harvest it, you grow it, uh, then you come back and you lay them on this matrix, and you can fit the matrix and put it into the lesion and secure it with fiber and glue. So the benefits are this is an all arthroscopic technique. You don't need to do any kind of open procedure osteotomy. It's suture free. So the OR time is significantly reduced. There's less chance of the cells leaking from out from under the periosteal patch. There's decreased risk of an uneven distribution of the chondrocytes and it can generate potentially hyaline like tissue. Um, but there's really, we don't know anything right now in terms of the, the long term results of this. There are a few studies out there that have shown uh, good results in the midterm, uh, but we'll have to wait and see how they do. Other modalities in the literature also show shock wave um, that could be used for this, as well as potentially pulse electromagnetic fields to try and stimulate osteoblast activity, um, but really no differences right now. Um, so in conclusion, I think that the successful management is still very challenging for us. The gold standard still for the smaller lesions is a bone marrow stimulant stimulation. Um, the operative outcomes are good in the short to uh, midterm. Um, I think you need to be concerned with longer term outcomes because it degrades over time, the fiber cartilage. And the question is, is this is mechanical or is this biologic insufficiency? Um, so the trend now is to uh, uh, mi try and minimize the damage. So instead of doing uh, puncturing the subchondral bone, just to breed down through the cartilage, uh, the calcified cartilage, it'll still allow for some bleeding of that subchondral bone superficially. And then you can do your treatment technique with some type of allograft mixed with a biologic. Um, in the end, I think we really need to find a better way to assess how these patients are doing long term. So we need higher quality studies. We need to assess the outcomes and correlate with a, a MOCART. Um, and maybe these minimally invasive techniques will allow us to look at these lesions much easier on a second look and see uh, in the end how they're doing. Thank you.